Hi, and welcome to Beyond Boston, a new collaboration between a growing posse of public access stations and the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism, or BINGE for short. My name is Chris Ferrone, and I'm the editorial director at BINGE, as well as the news and features editor of Dig Boston and a visiting professor of communications at Salem State University. As far as introductions go, I guess the only other important thing to know about me for now is that I started my career covering music, which I mentioned just to ready you for some of the arcane hip hop references that I may drop sporadically. Don't worry though, no turntables required. I started Binge with colleagues last year to fill the gaps in local media. Have you noticed, for example, the lack of critical reporting on municipal happenings around Somerville? How about Cambridge? How about writing on environmental issues, housing justice, education, transit and equity? You get the picture. A lot of people complain endlessly about the media. I know this, because in addition to having to listen to the rest of their curmudgeons, I'm one of them myself. Uh, you know, to the annoyance of my friends and family, I can barely go a minute without hollering about some awful coverage that's polluting my keen journalistic sensibilities. At the same time, if you can shuffle through the garbage, if you know where to look, there's some incredible reporting underway at Boston's ethnic, alternative, and community outlets. You know, like this one. Through Binge and with help from our supporters, our team is able to bring resources and ideas to help these publications and stations. With Beyond Boston, we'll be showcasing the very best news and features from some of the stellar community access stations in our region, from Brookline to Malden, several of which are being honored at the National Alliance for Community Media Conference taking place in Boston this month. Homegrown talent, bringing you news that commercial outlets overlook. The whole thing kind of reminds me of the intro to a song on the first Black Star album by Talib Kweli and Mostaf. You know, Kweli says, and I quote, Every day somebody asks me, where are all the real MCs? They're underground. For anyone who's unfamiliar with hip-hop culture, he's saying that while mainstream radio and other depraved corporate outlets like MTV tend to favor the lowest common denominators who rap for cheap thrills, the underground, which, by the way, plays the exact same role in rap music that it does in most other art forms, nurturing the purest and most traditional elements, remains a vital font of hope and talent. With Beyond Boston, we hope to tap that talent like a keg. So stay right there. We'll be back in less than a minute with Frank Morris from Cambridge Community Television talking about his popular Facecast project. Peace. Hey, this is Chris Frome from the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism, or BINGE. We help start Beyond Boston as a way to strengthen community journalism through collaboration. And this show is just one of several media projects we're bolstering. Check us out at bingeonline.org. And while you're there, become a reporter supporter and help grassroots nonprofit media for as little as $3 a month. Members get invited first to binge events, as well as access to our throwback posts that connect headlines from the past with contemporary news. Remember, when you support nonprofit journalism, you support all your favorite causes at the same time. Welcome back to Beyond Boston. I'm your host, Chris Ferrone. As promised, we're here with uh, Frank Morris, the Citizen Journalism Coordinator for Cambridge Community Television, also known as CCTV. How's it going, man? Very well, and thank you so much for having me on today. That's cool. I'm, I'm used to watching you on, on FaceCast, which is what we're talking about. You're, of course, uh, uh, extra cool um, weekly update on what's going on. Uh, you know, you're kind of like a name that's talked about. People know you around Cambridge. You're bringing kind of some new flavor. You got like kind of your Zoolander vibe on camera. You, you know, and what is it? What's different? What's different about what you're doing from what we've seen on, on a lot of community access television? You know, I think that one thing that we've tried to do with the FaceCast, as an example, that was something that we started last year. So it's called a FaceCast because it's a Facebook newscast. And it's a quick two or three minute recap of some of the latest stories that you can only find at neighbormedia.org. This is the, the citizen journalism platform uh, at CCTV. Um, it's actually something that I stole the idea from a uh, major network. Uh, they were doing a, a FaceCast. Yeah, it, uh, exactly. Uh, um, and 
I, th I thought it worked really well for them, and I thought about how it could be implemented mm -hmm. uh, at the very hyper-local level. Uh, as it turns out, it's been very successful. So we hear a lot, you know, uh, I remember a couple of years ago, buzzword ever, hyper-local, everyone was going to, everybody, you know, it was all about community journalism, everybody cared, right? Well, a lot, you know, there was like big investments, but it's gone a lot of it now, but you're still there. And, you know, I heard you present about CCTV recently, and like, my head was just spinning. I mean, there's there's so many programs going on. Um, what does it mean? What does uh, being a kind of community coordinator mean? What does it entail? Uh, what's your relationship with the, with the community? Yeah, a lot of it is a sort of this community organizing that is trying to uh, identify individuals who have something that they want to say, uh, stories that are going untold in mainstream media, uh, and and providing the platform and the tools necessary for them to be able to get these stories out. The stories about either their, their neighbors and people with these uh, extra special stories that need to get told or about issues that aren't being reported. So that's a lot of what I do is trying to find individuals that can report for the neighbor media team. Now, you know, this is a lot of things, we, so we've talked about this before. I mean, even a, a city like Cambridge, significant size, certainly a, a, a world famous city, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, well, a lot of tourist, a, a tourist uh, action going on in Cambridge. But still, when we look at it at the ground level, there's barely uh, a newspaper, and there's a couple. Uh, there are a couple, you know, websites, and of course the Chronicle, which I believe doesn't even have a reporter in the city anymore. More than ever, do you feel like this is a role that CCTV has to fill? Like, who else is going to cover the stuff that happens at the municipal level? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, uh, last year CCTV did a news survey asking. Cambridge residents if they feel that there's a lack of news and if CCTV can help fill that void and overwhelmingly people said yes. Uh, there's the Cambridge Day which is sort of a one-man operation there, the Cambridge Civic Journal another sort of one-man operation and like you said uh, uh, the Cambridge Chronicle doesn't even have a presence in Cambridge anymore. So there's sort of this hodgepodge uh, neighbor media tries to fill in those gaps through citizen journalism. Cool. So you know, uh, you by the way, won a, uh, you're about to win an award for your Facecast series. We we looked at a couple. We're going to play one, uh, a recent one. Um, some of the topics, you know, they really show examples of what you know the kind of journalism you do and how it's a lot more hyper local, say, than something you get in the Globe, which might not really satisfy somebody who lives in Cambridge and wants the, uh, you know, the ear to the street view. So, uh, Uber. Um, tell me about how, how, how do your journalists cover that in a way that's different? Right, that was something uh, Christina Kerr did a, an article about and she really ha was able to voice her own opinion. So you might have seen some of the Uber coverage in the mainstream media came from a very, uh, you know, a traditional journalism standpoint. Uh, Christina had her own thoughts about uh, Uber versus taxi and, and she was able to express them and get that viewpoint across that you wouldn't find in traditional media. In Cambridge, I remember I, got a, I almost got run over by a cab driver. He was like screaming and cursing at me because uh, he thought I was getting an Uber. I was just making a cell phone call on the corner. So I know it's like ground zero, so like to, to get that level of observation. Uh, another thing uh, in the clip we're going to watch is I know that you're giving not just activists in general, but youth activist voices. You know, we, we see a lot of youth activism and a lot of good stuff and even media making, but sometimes it ends there. It's not like distributed. You know, with a popular community access station like CCTV, how are you able to kind of harness a lot of that uh, action going on and, and show it to people what's going on? Yeah, we were fortunate that Reba Glory Cabral, who's a high school teen, she actually came to us. Her brother had interned at CCTV and she wanted to continue uh, sort of that relationship that her family has with us. She has a dream to be a news anchor, but she's also very involved uh, with regard to some of the social activism. And so uh, through Neighbor Media, she has that platform to be able to talk about these issues that are important uh, for her and her generation. Cool. So we're going to watch a clip in a second. But anything else you want to tell us about, you know, what we're going to see, but also just about how you, you know, kind of, you know, round up. I mean, this, it, you're right in Central Square. People walk by. It's like a, you're a part of the community. I mean, to the point where people can actually see in what's going on. It's pretty old school. You know, what's is, how is that reflected in, in the kind of work you're doing? Yeah, I, th I think that uh, through neighbor media, we do have sort of this. Um, it is it is old school, but also definitely new media. A lot of that in that new media. Um, you know, if you're interested in checking out more neighbor media stories, you can go to neighbormedia.org, and of course, like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Facebook is where you'll find the Facecast. Cool, and it's like uh, it's like all the best little tidbits. Going. Yeah, all the all the all the best. Awesome, yeah. let it roll. Right. Hello, everyone. Frank Morris here with your Facecast on Tuesday, August 25th, and a look at the latest stories from neighbormedia.org including one group of local girls taking action on an issue important to them. Girls Taking Action, a summer association that is part of the Mayor's Summer Youth Employment Program, 
has been tackling gentrification in Cambridge neighborhoods by gathering signatures of concerned residents wishing to bring the subject to attention of local elected leaders. GTA brings girls ages 14 to 18 together to solve problems and form alliances. Our 14-year-old intern and neighbor media reporter Reba Glory Cabral talks activism in the latest episode of Neighbor Media tonight. Learn what activism means for this local youngster, how she is involved in her community, and what advice she has to give for other teens looking to make a difference locally and globally when you watch the video. Recently, taxi drivers demonstrated in front of Cambridge City Hall outraged at how the Uber driving service has impacted their industry. Neighbor media reporter Christina Carrer offers her opinion on the matter and says, in the battle between UberX and taxis, doing the right thing should not be based on which service or business model is considered better according to personal preference, but on what creates a level playing field for business to strive, succeed, or fail on their own accord. Read more online. Christina also has a video bio on Kemp Harris, a local musician who has lived in Cambridge since 1978. Harris has an extensive bio that includes acting, composing, teaching, and writing. The two had a long conversation which included all the hot button issues locally and nationally, but it is Harris's music and artfulness that Christina admires most. Learn more about this Cambridge gem whom she considers to be a link to the past in her latest video. And new neighbor media reporter Odai Nakawa has the latest on road construction happening in the city of Cambridge. Crews are hard at work on Fairweather Street. The road work can bring headaches, parking problems, and even accidents, but will generally improve the quality of life in the city, residents say. Learn more about Cambridge's five-year plan for road construction when you watch Odai's video. And that does it for today's Facecast. For NeighborMedia.org, I'm Frank Morris. Hi, welcome back to Beyond Boston. I'm your host, Chris Ferrone. As I mentioned before, we're going to be featuring a bunch of features from some great community access stations around Greater Boston. Next up, we have something from MATV in Malden. It's from a show called Neighborhood View, and the segment was reported by Marsha Minong and Karen Lynch. Joining us in the studio, we have Hillary Walken. Hi. Hello. Uh, she's the uh, Development and Community Associate with Housing Families, and uh, you are... Um, housing Families is featured in the segment. You didn't uh, report it. Yes, that is correct. But this is community media, so there's like a, a very fine line between the activists, the people we cover, and the advocates, and of course the reporters themselves. Uh, can you just tell us about the event, um, you know, how you ended up on, uh, on this show? Absolutely. So uh, we have a family advocacy group. Uh, housing Families it provides affordable housing and emergency shelter for homeless families in Massachusetts. And part of that is we have a group of family members who really feel strongly about advocating for change in policy. So for example, receiving more Section 8 vouchers, affordable housing avail availability, uh, and then also just spreading awareness about homelessness. And they actually came to us saying that they wanted an opportunity to tell their stories in a public way. So from that came the photography exhibit that was featured in uh, Karen and Marsha's story. And uh, Senator, or, I'm sorry, Speaker of the House DeLeo uh, actually sponsored this to be at the Senate House or the State House. And it's photographs done by a humanitarian photographer named Meg Landers who took these beautiful portraits of these families. And some of them had never had portraits done of themselves before. And then we featured their stories of what their experience was like being homeless. And uh, it was on display at the State House. So, um, I just got involved being part of my work, uh, interviewing some of the families, writing the stories, and uh, coordinating the State House exhibit. You know, when we talk about homelessness in particular, and you know, as it relates to legislation, uh, just like the homeless invisibility complex. Like if it's not there, if a, if a uh, if situation not reported well, how can it be funded? And I've heard right. this cycle over and over. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of like the mentality here? It's like to you know to get that visibility for it. Is that all? Is it all play into the same? Uh, um, is that what you're trying to do? There is that aspect. There's definitely the the outreach and making it more visible. But there's also the breaking of the stereotypes. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of people nationwide view homeless people as you know the 
the people begging on the streets, oh, they're drug addicts, they're alcoholics, and there is some element of that, but a lot of homeless people are families. Uh, actually, the average age of a homeless person in Massachusetts is eight, uh, which is not the stereotype. So having the families take ownership and um, become more empowered to make change for themselves and for others in their situation by telling their stories uh, is really important for them not only in the process of uh, you know, bringing awareness to everyone else and making change, but also in bringing themselves out of the situation that they find themselves. And the clip we're going to watch, I mean, it's pretty, some pretty intense stuff. So Absolutely. as an advocate who's kind of like there, you know, uh, also as the media is, uh, is doing uh, their reporting, what is your job and how do you kind of prepare both sides and how do you get people comfortable? I mean, there's actually some really kind of just candid storytelling, mm -hmm. which comes out great. And I think that's why the piece is so powerful. Uh, you know, what's your role and how do you, you know, make sure everybody, is, I'm sure trust is a, a significant element. Absolutely. Uh, so I, in my development position, I work a lot with the press and um, making them aware through press releases and other forms of what's going on. You know, if we're having an exhibit, for example, the University of Massachusetts Lowell had a whole symposium surrounding this photography exhibit. Um, and we, you know, we have to let everyone know so that the public can come and hear the stories. But from a personal uh, standpoint, you know, when we're doing these interviews with these families for the stories, you kind of just have to let the camera roll and let them talk. You know, you can start with anything from we, we had one girl who was in high school still, and we said, okay, how's high school? What's your favorite subject? And then once they start to open up more, then you ask them more questions. People need to feel like you care about them right. in order to share the story. So the show's called, this show is called Beyond Boston. And one of the reasons is, you know, a lot of the issues like homelessness do get some attention, at least in Boston. But when, you know, uh, your organization works with families all over the state. Um, what is it like in the places like Malden, like these other places where homelessness isn't something that is associated with that place? Does that play also play into the stereotype issue? It's hard with families because there's almost no stereotype about them. They're located in motels, which I know we're trying, we're decreasing the number of families in motels, but you don't normally see them out on the street. There's one story featured in the photography exhibit where uh, a mother and her two children are living out of a car so unless you're walking by a parking lot and you see a family sleeping in a car, you're not going to know. Uh, so it's really hard to, to address a stereotype that doesn't exist for a group of people. And that's why we have our program of having families share their stories so that people know. And for those who still want to see the stories after the uh, after they see the clip, um, is there a place where they live forever? Yeah, <laughs> we have them at our main office in Malden, um, but it's also available to be shown elsewhere. So Catherine, uh, Congresswoman Catherine Clark has hosted it. We've had it at BNY Mellon and Everett. Um, lots of different places have hosted it, so it's available uh, for other locations. That's great. Well, thanks for stopping by. Thank you for having out. me. I appreciate it. Cool. Let's let, check it out. I was in a relationship, I was married for 10 years. Um, I wasn't allowed to work or anything like that. Um, but I finally got the courage to you know, decide for myself what to do for me and my kids because I was being physically, mentally, and sexually abused. Um, and I finally got out. Um, I got me a job, but it only lasted a couple of months because when I least suspected, he showed up at my job site with my kids and all their clothes and just stuffed them there. And I had to leave work. And when I went home, my furniture, all my belongings were in the yard. Uh, the locks were changed and so I lost my home and my job. It's a moment that you really don't know how, who to go to or whatnot. Um, my mother was also living with me so she became homeless herself. Um, my sister took her in, but she only had a two bedroom. Mm -hmm. So I was basically staying with friends, you know, here and there. But I felt like I was being a bother, you know. Sure. I didn't have no job either. Um, it was difficult. I was sleeping cars with my kids. Um, 
until one day I just decided to just get a suitcase, you know, one for each of us. And I just went into DTA and uh, I was there all day, no food, no nothing, until they placed me in a, a, a hotel. A lot of people say it's very uncomfortable, you know, you're in a, a room, but it's way better than having to sleep in a car or being in the street, cold, especially with your children. Um, as soon as we got there, we were just happy that we had a bed. It was air conditioned. You know, they was just happy. You can't cook or anything like that. Sometimes your food goes bad. But I mean, it's a blessing to have a roof over your head. Yeah. Um, my story, it was, I lived in Indiana and we had a house fire. And after the house fire, I decided after living in campgrounds and motel rooms that we would be better off living with my mom. So we moved back from Indiana to my mom's house in Massachusetts. And then um, she lost her house in foreclosure, which then we all separated. And um, I, was, I went to the DTA office. I was placed in the housing family shelter. And, I've been a part of the housing family since uh, July of 2011 and was placed in their permanent housing. Very nice. Yeah. So you have permanent housing now? Yes, I have permanent housing now since December of 2011. And they've really helped me get the, the benefits and the, the resources that I've needed and they've been really helpful. And they're still in your life, housing? Oh, yes, care. most definitely. I. I'm down in their office every day wow. for one thing or another. Yeah. They're like a second family. Mm -hmm. Public access television, what you're watching right now, is one of the greatest innovations of the grassroots movement for media democracy in the last half century. Also known as community television, it has helped cities and towns nationwide to have their very own cable TV channels, allowing residents to keep up with local news and views while enjoying a wide variety of arts and entertainment programming, most of which is produced by their friends, families, and neighbors, filling the gap in local nonprofit media options left by PBS and NPR. One of the best things about public access television is the way it's funded. Community media pioneers like noted filmmaker George Stoney helped craft regulations back in the late 1960s that made everything go. They were based on the principle that cable companies should pay an annual franchise fee to cities and towns in exchange for being able to build out their systems on municipal rights of way. In other words, companies like Comcast have to pay local governments for stringing their cables along public streets. That money can then be used to equip and sometimes staff public access stations. And those stations get used by the local population to celebrate their local culture, expanding free speech in the process. That funding mechanism worked pretty well, despite a bunch of political speed bumps there's no time to discuss today, until the telephone companies joined cable companies in offering broadband internet service about a decade back. Soon people in many places were getting all the content carried over the old cable systems and much, much more from both television companies like Verizon and cable companies like Comcast. This created a problem for funding public access stations because cable companies offering broadband still had to pay the franchise fee to local governments that is used to finance those stations. But telephone companies that now also provide broadband don't have to pay that franchise fee. This has potentially provided the cable companies an opening to get rid of the franchise fee by stating that it's unfair that they have to pay when the telephone companies don't, putting public access funding in extreme jeopardy. However, last year, the Federal Communications Commission ruled that broadband internet service is a public utility, raising the possibility that both cable companies and telephone companies could be mandated to pay a franchise fee to cities and towns in exchange for stringing their broadband wires on public land. The FCC is still figuring out how to proceed on that front, and they are under intense pressure from cable companies and telephone companies to free them from all responsibility for pu funding public access stations. So it is critical that everyone who supports public access media gets together with other interested folks in your community and starts building a new grassroots movement to demand the FCC apply the franchise fee to both cable companies and telephone companies. A win on this issue will keep public access stations funded for decades to come. And that's a big win for democracy. For Beyond Boston, I'm Jason Pramus.
Words to live by. Thanks a lot, Jason. All right, we're going to lead you out here tonight with a clip from Duck Village from SCAT TV. Thanks a lot for coming out. We'll catch you beyond Boston. First time at the Duck stage, so I'm super duper quack and excited. Um, this next song is called Hey Jimmy. For your good advice or it Singing out my sorrow And I'm a fan And gotta go alone My babe I'll catch the next parade Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism, or BINGE. 
We help start Beyond Boston as a way to strengthen community journalism through collaboration. And this show is just one of several media projects we're bolstering. Check us out at bingeonline.org. And while you're there, become a reporter supporter and help grassroots nonprofit media for as little as $3 a month. Members get invited first to binge events, as well as access to our throwback posts that connect headlines from the past with contemporary news. Remember, when you support nonprofit journalism, you support all your favorite causes at the same time.